I'm going to go ahead and start. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, decolonizing STEM and, in particular, um, thinking about uh, indigenous knowledge through system science, through systems thinking. Uh, the title of this is Indigenous Knowledge as System Science Decolonial STEM from Atoms to the Cosmos. And uh, let me get started. Um, with a little tour here of our website, uh, just so you can see where we're going with this. Um, so we have uh, uh, quite a wide variety of um, indigenous practices and, and uh, traditions and knowledge systems represented here. Uh, we've organized this in terms of computing topics on the front because the NSF kindly uh, provided funding from their computing directorate um, but here we've got it organized by culture. And so when you come to this site, you can click on either one. Um, everything's completely free and open source, open access. Um, and I'll give you a little example of, of what we've been up to. Uh, so under quilting, we've got quite a few different cultures represented here. We've got um, G's Bend, uh, which is an African-American tradition, uh, Appalachian, which is a, a low-income uh, white communities in the Appalachian Mountains, um, Lakota, and Anishinaabe. Um, and uh, let's start with the uh, uh, Anishinaabe, since that's uh, got such a great representation at these workshops. Um, so we, we uh, interviewed uh, um, Alice Williams, uh, pictured here with her uh, grandmother and her daughters and her granddaughter, um, all, all generations of quilters. Uh, and we just asked Alice, you know, if, if we could use uh, some images of her quilt designs and talk to her a little bit about um, how she's thinking about these patterns, right? We wanted to get, and uh, not impose our own mathematics, but, but get it from her point of view. Um, and she talks a lot about the importance of the medicine wheel, and she has a whole series of quilts uh, that she calls the medicine wheel quilt. So we thought that would be a great place to start from. And you can see we've... Um, Got a little background here. So uh, we always want to start the kids not with the technical stuff or the math stuff, um, but really starting with just enriching their cultural understanding of what's being represented and what the artist has in mind and what the tradition is and, and so on. Um, and then we've got a little uh, uh, interface here for the kids who are doing either uh, math lessons uh, or com uh, computing lessons. Um, they can use this block space coding. It's pretty easy to do. A lot of folks are familiar with Scratch. It's almost identical to the, the Scratch coding interface. Um, but we also have a few examples. Let me make sure that I've got my um, sound turned on here. You'll bear with me for just a second. Uh, let's see, share sound. Okay. And um, uh, so we've, we've got um, uh, one of the uh, uh, citizens of the uh, uh, Chippewa Nation here. She's a um, uh, was a graduate student in, in physics um, at the time that we uh, did this video with her. Okay, translate 100 out. Stamp. Translate negative 100 back. Rotate. Translate 100 out. Stamp. Translate negative 100 back, rotate. So you can see, um, you know, you don't even have to start with uh, uh, numbers or, or computing or anything. Uh, the kids can start with their own bodies. Um, and we, we did a workshop once where we had this power blackout. And so all the computer screens went blank. Um, and so we just went inside and stood on the, on the sidewalk. Um, and I said, okay, you know, find the... Uh, the X coordinate and the Y coordinate on the sidewalk and they, they, the kids immediately got it, right? And I said, okay, stand at the intersection of one of those um, and now show me translation in the Z coordinate. And they looked at me funny, the Z coordinate. And I said, yeah, it's in three dimensions. So the Z means you'd be going up. So immediately all the kids start jumping up and down, right? Um, so you can have a lot of fun with sort of body math and, and getting them to, um, you know, really get an intuitive sense for what it means to be thinking mathematically or thinking algorithmically. Um, and then for the uh, simulations that we have on the site. So for example, if I was gonna do the uh, 
um, Anishinaabe medicine wheel quilts. We do, do something like this. And the, the, at, at first, uh, we slow it down a lot so the kids can see how it's operating. So here it's slowly going through exactly the same thing um, that we were showing before uh, with that little performance step, right? So, so you translate, you stamp, you go back, you rotate. And you just do that over and over again in a repeat loop. Um, and it, it does indeed say a repeat loop right here. Um, so pretty easy for the kids to catch on to this pretty quickly. And they can go from uh, doing the medicine wheel at the very end to doing, I don't know, we'll, we'll put a flower at the end. And instead of the petals out here, um, Bye. Yeah, I can put something like a moose if I wanted a moose. Um, so now I'm making a moose quilt and it should have the flower at the center instead of the medicine wheel when it finishes up. And there we go. So, so it's pretty easy for the kids to catch on quickly. They really enjoy whether we're simulating, you know, leather work or bead work uh, or, or, or something else. Um, they're, they're pretty quick to catch on to how that works. Um, and then we like to do another step where they're physically rendering the virtual design. And so that, that can be really exciting things to see. Um, this was with uh, Anishinaabe High School students at a summer camp. Um, that's uh, my wife, Professor Audrey Bennett. Um, and so the kids are creating their designs. One, one of the students had a record number of 300 blocks in his script. And he, what he had done was connect the last block with the first block. So the whole thing just ran in an endless loop, which I just thought was so awesome. Um, and here are the, the, the kids mapping these out. We had a few um, uh, kids from the Navajo Nation uh, that were visiting that summer. And so they said, well, this is cool, but that's not our nation, right? That we're, 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 we're Dene. And so, and so they wanted to do the, um, uh, the four mountains and the, uh, the four sacred colors. Um, so that was the quilt block they did. And then when we put all the quilt blocks together, um, the other student said, hey, let's put the, the Navajo one at the center, which I just thought was really a, a wonderful act of, you know, uh, trying to bring everybody together and not make them feel like they were the, the odd group out. Um, but also just aesthetically, it was turned out beautiful. Um, so, so we've had a lot of, a lot of fun with, um, and we've been doing, you know, electronic quilts. So you can add LED lights and Arduinos and, and everything else with it. All right, and and uh, so that was that was quilting, but we do the same for uh, beadwork and and uh, weaving and uh, <laughs> a body art, all sorts of different arts that you can uh, have your students do simulations for and uh, mess around with these things. Um, I want to make sure I don't run out of time here, um, so let me go to our system science material, um, and that's down at the bottom here. Um, so we've got the uh, work we were doing on what are called engineered ecosystems. So when uh, uh, Europeans first came to the New World, um, they saw this incredible abundance of uh, biodiversity and, and, and just wonderfully um, robust uh, ecosystems. And they said, oh, well, this is, you know, untouched by human hands. But of course, that's not true at all. You have centuries and centuries and centuries uh, of ind indigenous people um, coming up with how to live in ways that actually enhance uh, nature's productivity, just as nature is enhancing our productivity, right? So the, the two things are happening in, in balance. So we have a little example here from um, uh, indigenous folks in Mexico, um, some examples of um, land ecosystems um, in that kind of balance. So if you're uh, familiar with the controlled burns um, that happen uh, uh, in uh, uh, Potawatomi lands, Ojibwe lands. Um, in uh, water ecosystems, you have some similar ideas. Uh, so these are clam gardens um, on the, in the Pacific Northwest, uh, where you can see that folks have actually built up these berms um, and then created a, a, a surface that's much more horizontal than it would naturally be. Uh, and as a result, you have an explosion in the type of shellfish that can grow in, in those areas. Um, and then um, we, you know, we don't want to make it all seem uh, nicey nice, and, and so we do have sections on colonial destruction. Um, but I, I wanted to make sure that the kids really had something positive to land on, right? That it's not just uh, that story. 
And so focusing on a resurgence that's happening around um, a lot of the, the, the native efforts to bring back some of these traditions um, and combine that in, in interesting ways with contemporary technology is just really wonderful to see. Um, so that, that was uh, uh, what we were doing around aquaponics. And we incorporated a lot of these concepts, uh, indigenous concepts of balance into that. So uh, in the Dene language on the Navajo nation, you would hear this. Uh, so hojon uh, would translate to balance, but it also means aesthetically balanced, right? So you think about um, reflection symmetry as a kind of visualization of, of balance, as well as um, balance between humans and nature. So you, you have uh, some similar concepts uh, uh, here in, in, in the uh, Northeast. Um, so, so for Anishinaabe, it, it'd be uh, Bimadizuin. Bimadizuin. Bimadizuin, the good life, uh, right, with, with some similar concepts around that cluster of ideas saying this has to be in balance or it has to be uh, in harmony. This is the famous uh, one dish, one spoon, uh, wampum belt. Um, and then we have some very specific uh, uh, environmental examples for the, the, the kids to get that that concept down. Um, and there's another uh, one of these CSDTs, culturally situated design tools, um, has been done around system science. So here we we have a little bit of um, uh, some some practice with flow charts and diagramming. You know what is it exactly that's creating the balance? Well, it's having these feedback loops, right? So if there's too much of something or too little of something. Um, it, it alerts whoever is monitoring this and they balance that out. Um, and so uh, just a, a bunch of different examples of that in here. Um, and then some, some contemporary parallels to uh, aquaponics and so on. Um, and we've got a little, uh, we've got a little simulation here. We can get that to trigger. Um, so here we've got our, um, uh, a little a little tank with uh, uh, some snails and some algae growing, um, and you can uh, uh, modulate the amount of water flow, right? So you can increase the amount of water flow here. And now I have water that has less salinity to it, um, but the, the <laughs> snails need a certain amount of salinity, so I can decrease that and you know find just the right balance. So I got as, as many snails as possible, but of course I don't want too many snails because then they're gonna wipe out the algae. Um, so again, that, that concept of negative feedback, bimata zuen, hojong, however you wanna say that, uh, is, a, is a nice uh, concept to utilize. And then we can do it for more complex examples of ecosystems. So here in this case, it's a simulation where we're doing rice irrigation um, and we've got it set up as ecotourism. So I would say, well, if I have you know, too many tourists coming in, they're gonna be able to plant lots of rice, but then I'm gonna to get too much pollution in my lake and I get eutrophication as a result. So here, um, I don't have enough rice, although I don't have any eutrophication in the lake. Um, and if I increase the number of tourists, let me do maybe 25 tourists here. Um, now I've got a lot more tourists um, of course, those tourists are now producing a lot more garbage. So the tourists did manage to plant lots and lots of rice, but um, as you can see, danger, too much algae is killing the lake fish. I've got eutrophication taking place. So that's, that's where um, we're, we've, we've sort of landed with these um, culturally situated design tools. Um, and now what I really wanted to present on um, was some research we've been doing that hasn't yet been created as design tools. And so I was really hoping to get you folks to provide some ideas and some feedback on how to do that transition from just research that I could present to a university to something that's really gonna come alive in the K through 12 classroom as a way for the kids to grasp onto this and a way for teachers to link it to the curriculum. All right, um, so we start with, uh, let me, get into uh, my slide mode here. All right, so we start with these um, biodiversity contributions that were going to Europe um, during uh, what's often called the Columbian Exchange. Um, and as you can see, it's very asymmetric. 
So we did indeed have some plants coming from Europe to the New World, but vastly more contributions were going from the New World to Europe. Um, and so in, in terms of food plants, there was you know, corn, potatoes, tomatoes, bell pepper, chili pepper, um, chocolate, vanilla, you know, uh, the, these, these things that we don't even think about as, as necessarily being uh, indigenous contributions. But if you look at those growing practices, they were indeed exactly because uh, indigenous populations have been working on them for so many centuries. Um, and this includes not only food contributions, but also uh, medical contributions. So quinine for malaria was just uh, an, an earthquake of changes uh, for the Europeans. Um, curare for eye surgery, even today it's still used. Um, in industry, you had something like rubber. For the first time, Europeans had a flexible material they could make, you know, automobile tires and condoms and everything else uh, uh, was coming out of, out of that indigenous knowledge of the, the latex sap uh, from these trees. So, so really amazing uh, uh, exchange that was going on mostly in this direction. Um, and we might want to puzzle about why that would be. Why would it be asymmetric? Um, we get a little bit of a clue here by looking at something like corn. Now, I could show you the varieties of wheat, but they all basically look the same. Um, the Europeans got about 20 different species from around the world, and uh, each species had about three varieties. This is 165 varieties, and it's only one species. It's corn. So, so again, we're faced with this odd puzzle. Why, what is it about Native American growing practices that were producing this explosion of biodiversity versus the European practices that were reducing it to just one variety? Um, and so I think of it like this. In the, in the case of the Europeans, they were extracting as much value as possible. And so you want to do, I, I got my master's in engineering and, and everybody always kept saying, optimize, 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 right? Um, so uh, if I'm trying to optimize, I want to find what's the one variety of corn that gives me the most money, the, the biggest bang for the buck. So I'm, I might find many varieties, but I'm going to funnel that down um, into the one optimum. But the indigenous practice is doing just the opposite. It's asking what practices will create the most variety. Um, so it's going from one to many, right? So um, I think of this as a kind of preparation for the trickster. And if you bear with me for just a second, I'll, I'll explain that. All right. So um, in a lot of the indigenous stories across the Americas, North America, South America, uh, you'll see this figure, the, 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 this um, uh, mythic figure, storytelling figure of the trickster um, who, you know, like a god, has some powers, right? But uh, it's not the Christian god of perfection. It's, it's an indigenous god of trickiness. Um, and, and so you have uh, Wewe Kotel uh, for the Aztec and Kokopili for the Hopi, uh, Coyote in the American Southwest, a raven in the Pacific Northwest, Aguara, the fox in South America, uh, and, and Nanabozo uh, uh, in uh, Anishinaabe lands. Um, so these are all, you know, small animals that you know, when you observe them in nature, they are indeed, you know, doing tricky little things. Um, but the stories are just amazing, right? The, the stories are always uh, just one crazy thing after another. Um, and so I think uh, these trickers gods are in a sense representing nature's unpredictability. When you, when you look at stories of, uh, for example, coyote or how the stars got in the sky, um, humans come along and they're very rational and sensible and they, they place the four bright stars, what we would call the Big Dipper, right? Um, and the star that does not move, Polaris. Um, but coyote comes along and does the thing with the, the, the blanket toss game with the mica dust. And that's how the stars got into the sky. So the tricksters are always doing something that's unpredictable and crazy and chaotic and creates a kind of diversity uh, in the world. So if you think about that genetic diversity and you think about the diversity of tricks that nature plays on us, you can then start to see how these things match up. You know, you've, you've got a drought one year and a flood the next year, and then a pestilence of bugs and then a pestilence of fungus. 
how are you going to keep up with all that variety of tricks that nature can throw on you by having an equally tricky, equally diverse variety of plant forms? Um, and so I suspect that's what's at the heart of this. And in fact, uh, Gary Nabom, who's an ethnobotanist, has done some interviews with indigenous farmers, and he says that's exactly what they report, is this emphasis on sowing as many seed types as possible. And even when I start pointing out to them, well, here's how you would optimize, they, they resist. They say, no, that's, that, would, that would be you know, throwing shade on the creator to say that, that we, we don't, we're not interested in the variety that you're, you're, you're offering us. Um, so a really profound variety of these things. Um, but was, of course, as I was showing you with our culturally situated design tools, we've never had a focus on biodiversity. We've always had a focus on order and regularity and algorithms, right? And that's what math teachers and computing teachers seem to want to, in order to connect to the curriculum. Um, so so I I've been mostly focused on that end of it and, and going around and, and uh, doing interviews with indigenous folks from uh, Africa, uh, India, South America, Alaska, many places around the world. Um, and everywhere I go, they would say, well, I would love to tell you about how we make those baskets or how we make that weaving or whatever it is. Let me show you the plant that I get it from. And I'd say, okay, fine, because I don't want to be rude. But, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, I hope this is quick because I really want to get to the math. And so it, it took me, <laughs> I don't know how many decades of getting hit over the head with this before I finally realized, no, 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 no. The, the algorithm isn't just in the weaving. There's a whole nother set of algorithms that are embedded in the ecological relationships. Um, and, and so in the particular, this particular case, uh, we were working um, with Dene Community College on the Navajo Nation, uh, interviewing uh, weavers and, and talking with uh, folks who were running a um, summer STEM camp on how to uh, have the kids do these uh, uh, simulations of the weavings and so on. Um, and I was really struck by um, the, the ecosystems that were being sustained with the sheep herding that was going on. Um, and I was reading through a little article about the um, biodiversity explosions that happen around the corral because the sheep go out and eat plants and then they poop out the seeds. So you get all kinds of different plants growing from all over the uh, uh, native nation uh, or growing around these corrals. So when the weavers are creating dyes for their weaving from those plants, they're drawing on that diversity, right? And, and then they're bringing a kind of regularity and order to it. So it struck me that there's a kind of um, rhythm here, a rhythm of life, right? That in some cases you're letting things go wild because that's the best way to do it. And in other cases, you're very tightly regulating things and bringing it to order. Um, and so really that's what my talk is about tonight is, is just trying to think about as we, as we move between modes in which we're doing things that are disorderly and modes in which we're doing things that are very orderly, um, how does that give us some insight into some of the um, underlying uh, uh, systems theory, if you will, uh, that's there embedded in indigenous knowledge and practices. Um, and then how do we bring that into the classroom? How do we translate that into the kinds of language and models that you could use in, in STEM education? All right, so um, I've got a group of, of collaborators that I've been working with. Uh, uh, Reagan Wadalusi is a, um, uh, a Navajo uh, a horticulturalist uh, professor um, does a lot of just amazing uh, interviews with elders and observations of indigenous practices and so on, and then brings that into uh, a kind of uh, agroecology uh, framework that she's been developing. Um, Abe Babahane is uh, originally in um, complexity theory uh, and, and now is very famous for the work she's been doing on um, uh, the dangers of artificial intelligence and how to guard against those. Uh, and bringing uh, some of her perspectives uh, from, from uh, uh, Ethiopia to bear on that. Um, Matthew Fletcher is here at the University of Michigan, uh, a Grand Traverse Band citizen, uh, professor of law, um, sits on the judicial bodies of several native nations. Um, so he's uh, brought some really interesting work that he's been doing on political organization before colonization 
um, and how to bring back some of those practices. Um, Audrey Bennett is an Afro-Caribbean designer, uh, professor of graphic design here at University of Michigan, um, also my wife. So <laughs> we've got our, our, our family operation going here. Um, Efron Cruz uh, is in uh, complex systems at University of Michigan. Uh, Chanda uh, Prescott Weinstein is our theoretical physicist. Uh, uh, Kwame Robinson is a graduate student. Um, I'm his doctoral advisor. Um, and uh, there's me down there in the corner too. All right. Um, so we've been looking at um, thinking about entropy as a way of uh, characterizing these modes between being very disorderly and being very orderly. And so if you're being disorderly, if you're growing a bunch of crazy plants and you know doing things that 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 require just a lot of complexity in a lot of different directions all at once, um, the entropy is very high. Um, and then if you use like a physics model, you know, as you cool the gas down uh, to a liquid, the entropy gets lower. And as the liquid gets even more organized into a crystal, um, now the entropy is very, very low. Um, another word for entropy is, is, is simply information. So um, they use the word uh, entropy to uh, measure how much information is in a signal, like a bit stream. Um, and uh, you can see that if I wanted to describe what's going on in this crystal, it would not require very much information, right? I could say, make a dot and move it over. And when you get finished with a row, go down one and do the same thing. That's a pretty small algorithm compared to an algorithm that tries to explain the position of all of these different dots, right? So that, would, that algorithm would be as long as the list of dots. Uh, whereas this one, there's so much repetition that it can be very, very short. So that's the relationship between entropy as a measure of uh, disorder in physics and entropy as a measure of information in something like a, a description or, or computation. All right, um, and we can do that in very ex exact ways. So there's, there's uh, some simple formulas for figuring out um, what the entropy of a message is based on the probability of each symbol in that message. Um, and it's, it's simply the, the um, sum of the um, probabilities times the, the log of the probability. Um, that gives you a negative number. So we stick a little negative sign in front of this so that, that it's now a, a positive number. Um, and so in a case like this, where you have a string of beads and the diversity is very low, the entropy is low. So the entropy here measures out as 2.72 bits. Um, in this uh, b particular bead string, the diversity is much higher. And so the entropy is higher. Now it's five, five bits of, of entropy. Um, and for those of you who teach something like environmental sciences, you'll often come across uh, measures of uh, metrics for biodiversity. It's exactly the same thing. It's, it's measuring the entropy. So it's the weighted sum um, of the percentage of each animal that's in the, the ecosystem. So we have, we have a little simulation here um, where we can, we can actually try that out. So here, for example, I can say I've got two red beads, four blue beads, and four green beads. Um, and I click on this and it now calculates the entropy for that string. Um, and I could say, well, you know, I don't think I was being very fair to my red beads here. There aren't very many of them. Um, so I'm gonna gain one of the red beads. Uh, I'll go to three um, and I'll lose one of the blue beads. That'll be back at three. And now I'll try this again. So the entropy was at, at 5.15 um, and now the entropy is 5.2. So the entropy has gone up because you have a more even distribution, right? Um, and if you think about something like the, um, uh, diversity of, of students at your school, you could say, well, you know, I visited this school and yeah, they had every different ethnic group there. They had uh, 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 Native American kids and, and African American kids uh, and Latinx kids, but 99% of the students were white. So even though they had every ethnic group, I don't think it was very diverse, right? I think the, the entropy was low. Um, and so when you start to use examples like that, you could start to gain some intuition 
about how to use that word entropy and then see it in the calculations. Um, and, and as an example here, um, uh, we, can, we can switch up the costumes. So instead of the red bead, we can say, well, what if this was an ecosystem uh, and I had a moose um, and I had, sorry, my um, controls here from Zoom are in the way here. I had a loon uh, and I had, gosh darn these Zoom controls, <laughs> I had a bear. Um, all right, and so now when I do it, you can see, you know, you can do exactly the same thing with animals as you can with colors of beads or skin color of the students or whatever it is, right? We've, we've got a general principle for thinking about uh, 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 diversity and measuring it uh, in, in, in this very precise way. All right. Okay, so um, I had this, this uh, example of Anishinaabe controlled burns up um, in part just because I, I, I'm here in Michigan and so I'm speaking to uh, Anishinaabe scholars and, and uh, uh, teachers and so on, um, but also because I just thought it was such a simple, clear example of this, right? You have very low entropy when you've done the burn. And then when the rains come and the biodiversity comes back, boom, this crazy explosion of varieties, right? And you have that modulation over time, swinging between the low entropy and the high entropy. Um, and as I was saying, you know, that gets complicated by the fact that you do the burns um, very quickly for a meadow every, you know, four years or something, longer periods of time for the bushland and, and maybe every 75 years for the, the forest or something like that. Um, and then we even have a little simulation so you can try out, you know, different uh, uh, periodicities and phase relationships and so on. Um, but here it is for the, the Navajo case. And it's the, really the same thing. So you have low entropy when you're bringing things to order and high entropy when you have things in disorder. And so if you think about that as varying over time, you get this lovely uh, sine wave of modulation, just like you had for controlled burns, right? So you, ha you have low entropy when you're bringing things to order and high entropy when you're, you're allowing that wildness, allowing that biocomplexity bio to just bloom on its own. Um, and so I've been uh, talking with uh, Reagan Wydalusi about uh, uh, Diné culture, and uh, she also interviews uh, Hopi elders uh, and um, uh, asks them, you know, uh, what kinds of practices do you use to help these things flourish? Because you've got these crazy droughts that happen uh, every so often in, in the, the Southwest. How do you get those plants to survive? Um, and say so they do a similar thing with uh, spatial varieties. So they'll say, well, when it comes to harvest, you need to be very organized, right? But it, when it comes to where the plants grow, you don't want rows and columns in an orchard like a European farm. You wanna find that wash where the rain came in and let's plant some, some peach pits there. And then let's find this other place where, you know, there's a lot of groundwater that got soaked in there. Let's plant some peach. And so it's, it's, it's somewhat chaotic, it's high entropy when you're talking about selecting growing spots. And then when it's harvest time, you really gotta be, you know, uh, uh, Johnny on the spot in, in terms of making sure that you're at the right place at the right time. And so that's has to be very organized. And, and um, Reagan's gone on to point out some things that I, uh, I'm still trying to wrap my head around in terms of, you know, order and, and disorder. So I think it's a, just a really rich lens to start looking at uh, indigenous practices and thinking about you know, uh, uh, how that modulation of high entropy and, and low entropy works. But I, I, I wanted to take those insights from indigenous culture and now bring that to bear on some of the um, basic STEM education things that we teach. So um, I'm always hearing about uh, genotype and phenotype. And so if you think about it as something that varies through time, Back when we were a um, genotype, when we were just a sperm and an egg getting together, um, we just had that one strand of DNA. And so it looks something like this. It's very low entropy, right? It's just very organized, ordered, uh, a crystalline strand of DNA. Um, but once we turn into flesh and blood, it, there's this explosion of a million different biomolecules and bioprocesses going on. And so things become very entangled and, and you've got that high entropy. And nature is moving back and forth between 
low entropy and high entropy for the fluctuations between genotype and phenotype um, in much the same way that we saw those fluctuations with controlled burns or the fluctuations um, between weaving and, and, and growing. So um, I was really fascinated by that. And I started thinking, well, maybe this uh, entropic modulation isn't just you know this clever little trick that, that indigenous folks are bringing to bear. There's an underlying principle there that's much deeper. Right, and maybe it's it's showing up in other STEM sciences as well, or or in social systems, or political systems, or whatever it may be. Um, so that's how we we came to bring together that group of scholars that I was talking about earlier. Um, so uh, this is a, a, um, a some work that came out of education, um, thinking about zone of proximal development, uh, which I'm sure all you educators are are familiar with, um, and the fact that you might have um, something that's too routine and, and the students are getting bored, right? Or you might have something that's too challenging, um, but really what you wanna do is hit that zone of proximal development. So they're always challenged enough to keep it interesting, but not so much that they're overwhelmed. Um, and when I look into the literature on this, uh, indeed folks often say, well, it's not just monotone, it's not just constant you're always practicing enough to get good at it before you go high entropy and move to the next step, right? So low entropy, routine, high entropy, new thing, and you're modulating back and forth to stay in that zone of proximal development in a kind of lively way. Um, so I was excited seeing that and realizing, yeah, it translates directly to just theory of education, right? Um, this is uh, Matthew Fletcher's work, again, uh, a, a law professor, as, as well as, as uh, sits on a lot of uh, Native Nation uh, judicial bodies. Um, and he was saying that the Europeans brought this idea of long term limits and kind of permanent stations, um, and that some of that has been adopted by Native Nations when they would actually be better off uh, using much more traditional structures where you have very short term limits and sort of specialized uh, uh, groups. He said the problem with the long term limits is you start to trade favors and pretty soon you've got the old boys network, right? You've got this hierarchy where there's one person at the top and they owe favors to the person below that and so on down and things become sort of fossilized and, and fixed in place. Um, and so he said that the short term limits, you know, you're there long enough to, to get a knack for it and get stuff done. But when it gets to the point where you're about to start that kind of um, turning it into a hierarchy, that's when you, you have the term limit up and now you bring in fresh blood. And so he, he said, you know, he, he thought this mapped on well to the way he was describing it. Um, again, like the case of, of Reagan uh, Wadalusi, it doesn't reduce to that. You know, when, when I spoke with Matthew, he had all kinds of things that he said you could bring to bear um, on this kind of, of framework. Um, but I like to, you know, try to get something that's kind of simple and straightforward that we could at least wrap our heads around uh, as, as kind of an anchor to the conversation. Um, I also do some work uh, in economy and especially, you know, how is the uh, digital economy uh, uh, chipping away at, at uh, uh, freedom and autonomy uh, of, of ordinary people as, as well as uh, indigenous communities and, and uh, urban communities and so on. Um, and one of the things that's happening is that these platform uh, uh, companies are getting larger and larger and larger and just increasing their domain in crazy ways. Um, and so uh, if you just simply look at the number of different companies that existed um, back in, in uh, uh, 2007, 2010, 2012, um, you really had a huge number of these different online companies they were all swallowed up, 98 acquisitions by Facebook. Um, and so all of those got swallowed up. And so now we're, we're reducing that high entropy diversity of different choices down to you know, the one corporation that rules them all. Um, not, not a particularly uh, a healthy way to run an economy. So um, we, we have a, a grant from the National Science Foundation to look at um, computing for these community-based economies. Um, and thinking about what kind of platform could actually be owned by the people who do the work. Wouldn't, wouldn't that make so much more sense if it wasn't, you know, 
uh, Mark Zuckerberg, who, who is profiting off of all the work we do putting things onto Facebook, um, but actually we, the people who put the content on there are, 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 are getting that. Or if it wasn't the folks who own Uber who are getting the money from Uber drivers, it was the drivers themselves that were getting 100% of the, of the profits. Um, so we've been looking at this idea that on the one hand, you want um, the opportunity for entrepreneurship and, and creative agency that folks bring to bear in the economy because it's just a wonderful thing to have. Um, on the other hand, you don't want to feel like, well, if I try to start a new company, I'm going to go bankrupt. Because if that's the case, then the only folks who can start new companies are the rich, right? You want to have those moments of stability and order and, and low uh, 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 entropy that, that offer a kind of you know, safety net and, and a fallback and a support, um, as well as the opportunities to get creative with coming up with different products and uh, commercial ideas and so on. And so being able to modulate between the two in economics um, has become an, an interesting place for us to think about this. Um, and then finally, our last category is in computing and physics. Um, and so I mentioned um, Kwame Robinson, uh, my graduate student comes from this background in artificial intelligence uh, and, and uh, uh, cryptography and, and machine learning algorithms and so on. Um, and so this is an interesting uh, example where if you're trying to find the optimal route for a merchant to visit all these different cities, um, it's uh, computationally quite difficult to do, to find the optimum. Um, and so one of the tricks they've used in artificial intelligence and machine learning is called a simulated annealing. And what it does is just by trial and error, it randomly throws out a bunch of routes, right? But if you try to do that exhaustively, the number of possibilities you have combinatorial explosion. And so what simulated annealing does, it says, well, let me first just try the longest distances, randomly go through those until I find the optimum at the longest distance. Then I'll try the shorter term distances within that and then the shorter term distances within that. So it is using randomness, but it's applying it in a kind of staged fashion. Um, you finally do get the optimum, but then of course, you know, a new city comes in on your road and now you have to re-scramble it again. So it's a great, a great case of where um, entropic modulation is just being used as a, a kind of learning algorithm. Um, and if, I, if somebody pressed me to say, okay, Dr. Aglash, you showed me all these different cases, but what do they have in common? I would say that's it. They're all cases of learning algorithms. Um, and the, in the case of evolution, biological evolution, um, this is how evolution uh, learns to uh, uh, create new organisms, right? This is the process of mutation, which is random high entropy, and selection, which is ordering and low entropy. Is it's, it's doing what the simulated annealing is, is doing. It's searching out a landscape um, and then honing in on, on what it finds and then doing that process over and over again. I suspect that's also what's happening um, in the, a lot of the indigenous growing cases is that um, it's not a machine, it's both humans and nature um, uh, going through this dance, if you will, uh, of entropy modulation. And, and then, you know, sort of, sort of finding that optimum, whether it's a drought year or a flood year or whatever it is, it's got a kind of uh, adaptive smartness to it. All right, so that's the case of uh, machine learning algorithms. Uh, um, Abe Babarhane um, has this wonderful example where she's using a bunch of different algorithms and finding the one that's optimal. And then she says the situation changes. And so once again, you have to go back to uh, randomly sorting through these things. So I, I thought that was a, a neat example of the same thing. Um, and finally, even in astrophysics, so you notice in the title, it said atoms to the cosmos. This is the cosmos part. Um, so so uh, even in astrophysics, uh, you have these really interesting cases in which the universe as a whole um, at one point seemed to be undergoing these entropy modulations um, as new stars were coming into birth uh, and older stars were dying out. Um, there was a, apparently a, a period in which there was some synchronization of that. And I, I guess over time, there was a kind of a randomness and that eventually dampened out. But this, this graph of what the initial cosmos looked like has this beautiful entropy wave in it. So I really love that example. All right. Um, so so uh, that's where we've ended up. And we've been trying to just you know, think through what does this mean for us as 
researchers? How can we sort of come together at this? How can we start to apply it to, to uh, uh, learning examples, learning contexts? Um, so some of the examples uh, of, of research questions we've been asking, I've, and I've abbreviated entropic modulation EM here. Um, one of my colleagues called, just calls it the wave, right? Um, so how does this, this uh, entropic modulation, the wave, um, appear in, in across these different scales and different domains? Um, some of them seem endogenous, meaning self-driven, right? So the ecosystem itself is creating these waves. Um, and in other cases, somebody's coming in and saying, no, 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 we have to burn the field now, let it regrow, burn the field, let, right? They're imposing it from the outside versus the modulation coming in from the inside. Um, and so we wanted to, to ask, you know, um, uh, or the, is there, there a common set where all the cases where it's imposed from the outside does this, whereas cases where it's coming from the inside does that, right? What, what sorts of commonalities do we see across these patterns? Um, the second group of research questions are just asking about what's good, right? The mod is a win, what's, what's healthy? What's robust? Um, so if I want a, a robust, healthy ecosystem, or I want a robust, healthy economic system, um, there seems to be a place for entropic modulation in that. Um, but how exactly does that work out? I don't want some rich guy coming in saying, oh yeah, I, I destroy my company every three years <laughs> and it makes me even richer. That may well be the case, but it's not what I had in mind for healthy uh, economic systems. So, so we, we'd like to know this uh, um, a characteristic of being more healthy, more democratic, more sustainable. You know, how do you employ uh, 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 EM research? Um, and then the third set of questions is the particular mechanisms you can bring to bear. So for example, in the economic case, we've been talking about, you know, we, maybe we need community banking instead of these giant corporate banks. Maybe we need, need land trusts instead of these mortgages that we seem to go to debt on for the rest of our lives? You know, what, what kinds of mechanisms can we bring in to uh, correctly insert either the right amounts of order or the right amounts of chaos where, where it's needed, where it would, would contribute to these more sustainable, more uh, democratic enterprises? All right, so now comes um, your part of it. So I've left some blanks here um, and I'm gonna put this uh, link in chat. Let me copy that link there and see if I can get it into the chat here. Is this going to let me do the chat? Yeah, it will. All right, you now you now have the link to this slide, um, and you can you can just go in there and edit it yourself. Um, you can type a message into chat if you pre prefer to do that. Um, you can just unmute your speaker and speak out. But I would love to get some ideas from folks about what to explore next. Where, where might entropic modulation pop up? How might we use this sort of thing with our students? Shelly asks, should it be different or should it build on what you have created? Um, I was kind of thinking about the questions that you had previously, because I'm really interested in your social model that you were talking about with like entrepreneurship. I would love to see more work in that and communities building themselves, taking out the corporations. So that was really intriguing to me. However, I, did you want me to think of something outside of the work that you're doing? Because I'm really, this is amazing. I, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled with anything folks come up with. Okay. Um, uh, uh, are are you able to type into that little table there, Shelly? Um, yes. Uh, wait. Yeah. Oh yeah, I think that's me. Um, are yes. You, are you the anonymous camel? I, I maybe so. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, try try typing something. See if it works. Huh? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's not working for me, um, but you know what the problem might be is I've got two different emails going right now, so my work might be. I, w I wouldn't think that's the problem. I wonder if it's just like the text size or something. Okay, I'm, I'm going to try it again. I'm going to try to download it this time. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Um...
Is there a text color here? Is that why it's not showing up? No, when, when I do it, it seems to show up. Anonymous Manti is doing great. Um, so, so I'm going to give folks a little bit of, of time to type things in or, or, or throw things into the, uh, the chat. Um, and while that's happening, um, I can show you uh, a few other things. So um, Generative Justice is the website where we keep a lot of the economic uh, activity. And so you can see um, some of our projects there. This is the um, Artisanal Cyborgs um, project where we've been doing a lot of the um, automation for the artisanal economy. Um, last year, uh, Dan kindly invited me and we presented on the um, artificial intelligence that can make a distinction between uh, factory made fakes and hand weaving. Um, so that's that's been part of that economic activity. Um, we have a little, uh, here's our diagram for just sort of thinking through what that would look like economically. Um, this is a group in Africa we've been working with. We sent them a laser cutter so they could use some of those um, simulations. And um, we, it's an intergenerational collaboration between you know auntie and grandma that have these old school sewing machines. Um, and then the younger generation, they really want to do something with computers and laser cutters. And, and so it's a way of bringing them together and they've started their own company, which was really exciting. Um, this is another group. Uh, we've got um, Don Smith who does uh, textile design in Detroit. Uh, but we've got our uh, kente cloth weavers in Ghana. Um, and then we've been using uh, generative AI and simulation tools. So Don messes around with the pattern, sends it to the weavers. And then we didn't want a big corporation making money you know, like Etsy or something like that. Um, so we found a lo local entrepreneur um, in Detroit who was shipping these uh, braiding extensions. And we said, you know, would you just like to expand the repertoire of things that you ship uh, to uh, cloth from overseas? And she was thrilled with that. Um, so we now have a little kind of, kind of a loop going between um, creating and simulating and weaving and, and shipping. And Dawn's now taking those cloths that she gets from the Kente weaver and in Ghana and creating clothing out of it that she sells in, in Detroit. Um, so uh, let me see where we where we got here. Um, that was the manatee. I don't know if the manatee is also Shelley. Oh, further research on social justice for community economics. Yeah. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize my speaker was off. That's me. Um, and I'm thinking of some other ideas, but I may just email them to you. But please, this yeah, really yeah. cool. Yeah, great, great. Yeah, we we would we would love to have folks uh, uh, email us with with follow up ideas, or if you just you know you wanted to do the virtual bead loom in your classroom and 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 uh, uh, want some help with that, we're we're more than happy to help. Um, anybody else before we close? Oh, I was curious as well on your website. Um, are they already, because I didn't really have time to, I was more listening to what you're saying. Do the students have time to play around with those? Like, are they in time working with our students in the classroom? We're, we're, we're nothing but play. Okay. So, so um, uh, I can show you them. So the main site, it's uh, csdt.org. Um, remove that goofy little thing there. There we go, csdt.org. Um, and, and so um, uh, when they first uh, go on to here, uh, whatever it is they're doing, you know, they'll, they'll get some cultural background. So in this case, it's, you know, where did cornrows come from? Um, mm -hmm. And then there's a, there's a tutorial. So if they've never done programming before, or they want some help oh, using the little- that's, uh, This is what I was wondering. So it does go through how to do Step step by step, hold your hand at every step of the way. Okay. Tutorials, um, and th and then uh, there's the software, which is just sort of free play, like I was showing. Um, mm -hmm. And then um, uh, under teaching materials, you'll find you know different things that that different teachers have done. So the the um, uh, bead loom in particular, I, I I think has has been one of the um, uh, most prolific in terms of things that that teachers have contributed to that. So so just a, a 
quite a, a, a wealth of different uh, uh, curricula and syllabi and activities and different ways of evaluating this, the, the students and some neat photo galleries about all the different work the students did. Um, some, some of them weren't even in beadwork, right? So they did virtual stuff on the screen. And then we had a ceramics teacher who said, no, I, I wanna have the kids do these, these ceramics with it. I don't know what these are, they're like little plastic Lego parts or something, but they did something with that. Um, this is a teacher that did uh, uh, backlit jars of dye, I think, um, and marbles and all, all kinds of just really interesting. And some of them are, are, you know, they just printed, did a paper printout of what they had on the screen. Um, but just really lovely stuff that, that we've uh, been, been seeing the uh, teachers contribute. All right. Um, well, I am going to end there. Uh, a big uh, uh, miigwech uh, to everyone for coming by. And uh, uh, it's uh, Aglash, my last name, uh, at umich.edu uh, is my email. Let me throw that into chat as well. There you have it. All right, miigwech. Thanks everyone. Great job, Ron. You can stop the recording if you didn't already.